calls a parliament, and it's going to create these railroad monopolies. You might think a railroad's a good thing, but once a railroad comes, you're addicted to it. You need it, and you got to pay whatever the railroads charge. And it's going to be, well, it's going to put a lot of people totally dependent and will eventually lead to the government taking over the railroads, almost all over Europe. Yeah, I like that. I'll, I'll show you another railroad when we get to, I'll take a day in about two weeks, I got to do romantic art because I like art. And I'll show you another really good picture of that. And let's jump to this then. This is what we call the market revolution. And market, the market revolution is this new system that's being created where we can have the elements of capitalism. And so we'll get to capitalism in just one second, but this new market economy, but the transportation and financial revolution, all that started from the industrial revolution. So you see it being called this market revolution. It's really all because of the industrial revolution, this new world. You know, I can tell you the importance, I'm spending a few days on this, so I'll give you an idea of how important this is. But you think about if you're here first semester two, you know, we started with prehistory and everything from cro magnum Man all the way up into Homo sapiens sapiens, and then Sumeria and Egypt and Greece. For most of human history, it was not the same system we have today. This is relatively new and radical. And so let's get into capitalism. Before we get to that, we got to get to one man, Adam Smith. Everybody's favorite Scottish philosopher, what today we would call an economist. And when I went to Edinburgh, I told you about that, Nate Haggis, part of the reason was to find the pilgrimage to his grave. And he would write a book, don't write down the full title, just simply write down in 1776, it's called The Wealth of Nations. And he copied a couple Arab philosophers. So it's not like he invented this. But he laid out the mysteries of the market in a way that nobody ever has. It's a brilliant book. It's hard for us to read. The 17th century pro. It's like there's no grammatical rules. There was no set dictionary yet. So the spelling is weird. There'll be like a full sentence. It's like a whole page long. It just It's hard for us to read. We're used to a certain style that's going to come 100 years later. I had to read it for a class, and I did not appreciate it. Like anything else you have to read, it's never as good. When I got older and a little bit more wise, I read it again, and I, it's kind of, it was really good. But then again, I could read it for my own personal needs. And in it, the big element was he was attacking mercantilists and the monopolies that these big companies were doing to extract wealth from, from colonies and do things like the East India Company for Britain had a monopoly on tea, which would uplead to the American Revolution. And he was attacking this by saying there's a better system of the free market. And in it, there's a copy of The Wealth of Nations, The Aquarium. Oh, the title's a book, it's so long. It's a really interesting book. Most people who talk about The Wealth of Nations have never read The Wealth of Nations. And so let's get to a little bit about what it was. We're gonna jump right to here, the free market. And then he talked about something called the free market. And the free market is basically this. Now, before you write down anything else about the free market, the free market has never existed. There's never been a totally free market where there's a free interaction of goods and services anyone can buy, anyone can sell. This has never existed. He's talking about the idealized system and that we should get as close as possible. But I'm serious, there's never been anything like a free market. If you don't believe me, go to Somalia and try to set up a store. You will last about a day before someone comes and takes everything you have. Free markets need laws. They're established by governments. Remember, the first market was established in ancient Sumeria, and that was made by the local city governments. So this is an idealized version. And the idea is that, that Adam Smith said is us. Society functions best if everybody operates in their own self-interest. I should be clear that he may, he said that these are a bunch of greedy, rapparous, uh, horrible, malignant people who are involved in business. They are greedy and awful, and it's also the best system. Because if everybody's acting in their own interest, they'll make the best rational decision for themselves. 
if you're trying to act in somebody else's interest or allowing somebody else to do it for you, you can be cheated, you'll miss stuff. The idea is everybody acts in their own self-interest. Now, of course, this also implies that everybody acts rationally. This might shock you. People don't act rationally. And therefore, it doesn't work very well. But a couple things about it. What he believed in, instead of monopolies and mercantilism, there should allow for competition, that people should freely be able to enter the marketplace and buy and sell goods. And if somebody is selling something that people really like, more people can come in and sell, anyone can buy. And if you don't sell a quality product, you go out of business or have to change, this will lead to better quality and will control prices. If you're a competition, with somebody else, you can't raise your prices, even for even if it's for somebody something that people want, because your competitor will undercut you. And so this will control it. Same deal in an open free, if they had a totally free market, and you're let's say selling food, and you're selling food that happens to be made out of arsenic. It was cheap, but we got a good deal. You won't last in business very long. So it maintains quality. It also encourages innovation. But what he said is, this is best. Everybody operating on own self-interest to get the best price or the best profit available. This is your basic economics graph. If you've, if you've taken any class with economics in it, you might have seen this graph. Uh, the demand for goods and the supply for goods. And this interaction of supply and demand will set the prices. And he dubbed it the invisible hand of the market. It'll find this equilibrium that will set prices. Basically, what it means is this. If you have a certain supply of goods, it'll match a certain demand that people are willing to pay. If you make too many of the goods, no one will buy it and companies will go out of business. If you don't produce, too, if you don't produce enough, the price will go up too high and you won't be able to sell it. It'll find that interaction. And what Adam Smith said is, in a perfectly free world, let the market just decide. It's not clear. There's no like set price you do. But you know, if you put out a quality good, you have to find a price, though, that people will still pay and you can stay in business. Same thing as a consumer. You might like a product, but if it's too expensive for you to buy or not worth it, you won't pay for it. This invisible hand. And then how is the best way to achieve he talked about a division of labor. The best way to do this, to achieve the highest price, highest quality, and the lowest cost, would be instead of having one person try to do everything, have divide the labor up until you do one thing over and over again until you become very good at it. You produce it really good, really good, really good, so you become efficient, work faster. You try to do everything, it's almost impossible. His example he gave in the book were pins. I mean, like a sewing pin. But just imagine right now, if I say, okay, tomorrow you must make a sewing pin. Where would you start? You need iron, right? You need cobalt, you need nickel, you need a furnace to hook to heat this up, you know, you know, I have to be able to kind of scrape off the impurities to make steel called puddling. Then you have to know how to make a mold that won't break apart if you pour in red hot molten steel into it. Iron bends too easy. That's hard to be a neat steel. So it's really hard to make. You have to know how to make one. You have to know how to be able to open it up at the right times without the shatter. And you have to know how to, be able to file it. That means you need to know how to make all this and a file just to make one pen. Volunteers. Now, just imagine if you have one person who's really epic, the miners, knows how to make the kiln, knows how to, the puddlers are not to make the steel, the molders to shape the mold out of, out of ceramic, that's what they use, and so on. You become really good at that, you become more efficient. Now, you can see the next step of this. We've already talked about this, the moving machines. Now, machines can do it. When I was in elementary school, I know people think, wow. And we had a teacher, and it's funny, I had this little exercise still stuck in my head. This was third grade, Miss Gary, but we had to make little paper hats. There's a little paper, try to clean your hats. And we had one half of the class, you just made the hat yourself. 
in the other half of the class, one person moved one fold, one person moved another fold, one person went stable, make little paper hats. And it was a competition. Who could make the most hats, individually or just a person working in one? And I'll never forget this because we start making it, and the people who were folding it by hand, doing it all, we jumped way up in the first like half, whatever, 20 minutes. And they caught us and beat us by almost double because they got more efficient, they got working harder, they got more. The word is productivity. If you divide the labor up, each worker can produce more per hour. By the way, if you produce more per hour, that drops your costs. What can you do to the price you charge for your goods? Cost drop. Can't you cut your price? Undercut your competitor? So I should ask, who has the advantage in this? Big or small? Big, big audience. Their costs are going to be lower. Remember that whole thing? Imagine that whole process to make one pin, one sewing pin. Think how expensive that is. Think how much cheaper it is for that whole process if you make a million. Who has an advantage? A little tiny store or Walmart. If you don't believe me, go try to store near Walmart. Or you're going to try a restaurant, start near McDonald's. It doesn't even, even if your quality is significantly better, they have, they have the advantage. So, Here's the next big thing. All the profit goes to whoever can control the manufacturing in the factory system. They get it all. That's your incentive. This is the great fuel. If you want to start a business, it's really risky. But what is your reward? The profit. You get it all. And I've said this before. I've set this up. And now we really got to set it up. Oh, don't worry about inequality. We'll get to the wage system. What's, what decides wages? Supply and demand. What happens if you're skilled, if you're the most skilled person in the world, will that improve your wages? Unless you're skilled. Yeah. And you might say, well, what about hard workers? Well, companies might pay a little bit more for hard workers because you know how difficult it might be to replace a hard worker. If you're good, you might leave, so it might give you a little bit more. But it doesn't mean it's necessarily because of that. And then one more thing. Monopolies have an advantage. So in the market, there's going to be inequalities. Whoever has the biggest can drive the comp or their competition up. And so Adam Smith said, the best system is to let all of this go. But there's one problem, monopolies. So there's a role for government. Government must regulate. Government's got to regulate. And what do they regulate? They break up monopolies. So put a little arrow there. Put a little arrow. They break up monopolies. Now, in the 1870s, 1880s, there were anti monopoly rules all over the United States. And so corporations, this new thing called corporations, came up with a way to create a monopoly that was you know, finding a loophole in the law. And they were called a trust. It doesn't really make sense today, but they called it a trust. So today in the United States, Anti-monopoly laws are called antitrust. It's an artifact of 140 years ago, but anti-monopoly. So that's the market. And what we come up to is what's called capitalism. Capitalism is a market economy where people own the means of production. They own the machine. One person owns it. So we have this market that Adam Smith talked about, but all the methods to build the big pins, they own. And there's a couple important things about it. If they own this and everything is bought and sold, that means everything becomes a commodity. Everything in capitalism is bought and sold, including humans. And it is fantastic at production. If they can innovate, and there's all the incentives to innovate and form their methods of production. It is an absolutely incredible method of production, and I should add, of innovation, of new products. When you look at the development of capitalism, once at the steam engine, once it started, think how fast it went. By the end of the century, we have electricity, telephones, phonographs, recorders, motion picture. Next century, we have airplanes, automobiles, television, radio, I can go on and on. Frozen concentrated orange juice, 
they made everything that a person could need. But there's one problem. It's not very good at distribution. There's a flaw in distribution because it flows to where the money is. And if you don't have money, you don't get it. And that's always a problem. The wealth flows to a group of people, small group of people, and you don't have everybody else with money, they can't afford to buy the products. And you have these distribution problems. What would this lead to? Oppression, inequalities, and revolution. And we have this issue today. We don't notice as much in Montana. At least we not. We didn't used to. But you can really see how the distribution is different if you go to Bozeman today. I mean, there it is. There's a whole new class of people coming. And it's not. There's a lot of people coming to the state. There's people coming. They need a job. They work. That's not the same. All right. So it's a market economy, though. Now we have two distinct classes. Two distinct. There's always been classes. We have the capitalists. You'll see these called another term for the French middle class, the bourgeoisie. And like I said, they take the risk, they get the profit. They're wealthy. And then you have labor. You'll see them called the proletariat. And some of you might remember Roman history, proletariat, that's the lower class. And they get wages. And this is going to be a conflict that's going to last for the next hundred. Well, it's still going on today. They get the profit, they get the wealth, and they took the risk. They would argue they deserve it. All they get is they work harder. That's just more profit for them. And I should add, if you're working in a factory, what freedom do you have? Not much. So let's get to a few things that happen out of this. Some of their reactions would be, one of the most famous would be called the Luddites. The Luddites were in England, and they would say they're followers of King Luddite. And these were skilled craftsmen who saw these new power looms as taking their jobs. And they went place to place and began to rip up and tear up the machines with the idea to protect their jobs for the new, for the new power looms. Now, I remember being taught this in, in college years ago. Uh, this, it was in a European history class. And my professor A is all right. But he said that this was like, they didn't like the new technology. They were opposed to the technology. No, they didn't have anything against the technology, so to speak. These people knew that a skilled craftsman, they got paid well. If they go to just simply being somebody like anybody else who operates a machine, what's going to happen to their wages? And what's going to happen to their power? Losing your job to a machine is terrifying. It's absolutely a terrifying idea. And just the idea. The, the, the prospect of this is, is really scary. It turns out it never quite happens the way that people think, but it did. It failed. We're going to jump right to here. This area of northern late England would be the most part. It failed, but it showed that workers were really worried about this. You'll see the same thing in France and the delayed industrial production for 40 years. We saw from Germany, and it's part of the reason why so many people who, what is now Germany, would go to the United States to try to flee this. The United States didn't have this that much because we had a shortage of workers. Well, in 1819, the first real effort for workers to fight back into this system that seemed to be taking away their rights as they're being forced into cities with no economic power would be called the Peterloo Massacre. And this is six acts from the, uh, from the Bible. But this is one of the things they said we must... They'd rather fight for freedom, die like men, than live as slaves. And the big thing you need to know, this was a march for political and economic justice. They wanted a little piece of the profit, and the big thing they wanted, they wanted the right to make the laws, the rules. They marched in Peterloo, which is in London, and nobody's really exactly sure what happened. Whenever there was like a peasant march, they sent out the military. They were surrounded with cavalry. And it was unclear who gave the order, but the cavalry charged in and started hacking people apart, killing or wounding over 200 people. And a peaceful march for economic rights and just the right to vote. Now, this did not erupt in a full-scale revolution, but you can imagine people, especially those in power in England, thinking, they outnumber us. We better do something about this. And this is going to lead to a series of a government response. So let's get to a few of these responses. 
The first one is called the corn laws, and that'd be a tariff on food. Corn is their term for grain. Corn is any plant. I, I know I mentioned this once before, but any plant that has a seed. So grain, wheat, maize. In the United States, we kind of do that British term and turn corn into but most of the fight that we did the corn. So they put a tariff or a tax on imports on corn. And their whole idea was to protect English farmers, but also the English landholders in Ireland. A couple more things. They abolished slavery. Oh, don't worry about the board truck. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. They abolished slavery. The idea being they'll be reliant upon free labor, reliant upon wages. I should add that uh, that didn't change how they still treated workers in their colonies. They just didn't call them slaves anymore. There was a 30-year movement in England to abolish slavery. And there weren't many slaves inside of England itself. This is mostly just colonies. Also, they passed the Factory Act which limited some child labor. No longer would children under the age of 10 have to work uh, 50 to 60 hours a week in a factory or a mine. I'm with you, they should be in the factory. But this was seen as a massive improvement. The United States, anybody know what year the United States would adopt child labor laws? Or not? 1938. There are states right now that are trying to get rid of it. It's back to work. The big thing is so they can extort labor from immigrant workers. But yeah, right now. And there's something called the new poor law. And it was it's a place to house the poor, what they called indoor relief. They're going to create these things called poor houses. And the idea would be is that this indoor relief, they're poor, we will have this house where they can live and learn how to work in this new system and in a way punish them for being poor. So this is the response. But one more bill in 1832, it was called the Reform Bill, and it would make for more for fair representation in Parliament. They got rid of what's called the rotten boroughs. Boroughs were parliamentary districts where there like, might literally be one family living. So they got to send, their, they got to send the, the head of the household to Parliament and he had his own seat. Where places like London just had a few, if any, members of Parliament. And so it was to make it more equal in Parliament. Did it make it more equal? Yeah, little bit. Little tiny bit. But still, and they allow for more people to vote. But that is the reform. Look at the big number. Now, 3% of the population could vote in 1832. That's pretty crazy. What was the percentage of people who could vote in the United States in 1832? No? About 20. Most white men, nobody else. Most places there was no vote. So this was still relatively um, dem democratic, but still, most people could not vote by 1884, uh, which happened right here. Here are the poor houses. And the poor houses would house the poor in these miserable little shacks where they would be worked without pay, with the idea being that they will be trained and taught how to work in the workplace. And what they believed was, the thought, the thinking was that it's a moral, why do I put moral failings and moral failings? Moral failing, I meant to say being poor is a moral failing. Being poor was a moral failing. There's something wrong with you. The reason you're poor is that you're, you're, you're immoral and inadequate and you're not working hard enough. And you're, and if you're rich, that means you must be working hard enough. Here's a cartoon mocking it. And these systems would be basically like prisons where families would be forced to work. They exaggerate and be chained up, but they would be punished if they did not. They were not going to be paid for with the idea being, look what happens if you're poor. Go get a job. The problem is. Jobs require somebody with capital to be making money. If a company isn't making money, they're going to shut their doors and, and lay off their workers. It has nothing to do with the workers being lazy. And these are the number of poppers eventually over indoor 
indoor juveniles in London alone was 254,000 with it boxed up in these full houses. And they made these kind of weird um, trying to go to places where they could control everybody. In the United States, they made the same thing into prisons. All right, we'll quit right there. Global Lives Beach, Monday, Wednesday. You guys aren't going to be here anymore, are you? So 19-2 will be on Wednesday. Any juniors in here? A few juniors. All of you thinking they excited? No. No, not hey, read the questions carefully. Read the questions carefully. It is hard to do a test online. And it's easy to mix up your places. It's really easy. And I know you've done those high rating tests, but the ACT, as I understand it, it's going to be more choices on the paper. It's going to be more reading on the screens. And so read carefully. Do your best. What time do you have to be here tomorrow, Juniors? 8 o'clock. No. 7.45. Hey, press the press. No. It's 7.45. Sorry. 7.45. Yeah. Okay. Do I don't know why I said 8 o'clock on the sheet they gave me. 8 o'clock is when they're supposed to be starting the test. You have to go through all the process and stuff. You have to be... And you have to be at the library at 7.40, before 7.45, because you have to register. And it is going to be all the juniors trying to register at the same time. The later you are, the more awful it's going to be. And you guys did it last year. They just had the baby, right? They just sold the paragraph. Was that what you guys did? So it was like 54 degrees at that moment. I was trying to take the test. <laughs> Give you focus. No, it was brutal. It was brutal. I mean, I, I, just, I, just, I didn't know about yeah. it. So you, everybody was. So that's why it was still like starting. Yeah, it was full when you did the test. Yeah. Well, well take it earlier though. Not even anyway. Pretty close. You know, it was like, huh? It was in April. Quite. Yeah. AC taste. I did the ACT many, 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 many. So I wonder how many students I'm going to have. How many teachers have their parents of all them out of school? I've never been so Mr. Kelly told me I could go to the council. Delaney, were you the only one here zero period? Yeah. I walked by and I thought, I looked at you and I thought, I think that's Delaney. Just have to remind me. That's only thing. I want to check. So you're the only one, Mr. Kel. Oh, you're Mr. Kelly's class. I'm looking right now. So, Emma, you're going to have to do uh, your presentation today. So, on your ready. Yeah. Okay, good. I think it's going to be you. Tom, maybe her. Rip. Yeah. Short. Yeah. Short. 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 One's a junior, one's a senior. And Tom was senior. I'm Tom. Looks like four years. Junior. And then maybe Ryland. Yeah. Berlin was here, so it wouldn't be about six months. We're just going wider. I mean, like, because I want this rip the really games American games. Yeah. 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 
I'm going to think about it. We might have to give one more day, maybe give it a W. That might be the exception. Oh. I have a very good song in my yard. Yeah. 